All right, you can turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 4. The much anticipated Revelation chapter 4. Finally got it done. But, you know, got a lot of other things going and stuff, and stuff comes up. So, like I said, it's not going to be on a weekly basis. Other times I'm going to be interjecting other studies and things. Um, but let's start out here. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And verse 2, Immediately I was in the, th the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So they say, you know, I've talked about this in other studies, but they say there's not one verse that proves that anybody was raptured that was caught up before the, the tribulation. Right there's one. Okay? He was caught up. You say, well, it was in spirit. Yeah, but he left beforehand. Right? Now you say, well, why couldn't it have been in body? Not just the spirit going up. Well, because then that would contradict the other scriptures that talk about the dead in Christ rising first and things, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. You know, the Lord took John ahead in the future to whenever the, the rapture happens, and he was caught up in spirit to see what happened. All right? So his body, I believe, was left on the ground. But the point is, you know, because God couldn't have taken him bodily up into heaven because then that happens later on. But the, And there's a bunch more we could say on that. But John goes up. But there's three very important things there in this passage. Notice, number one, a door is opened in heaven. And then you have a voice, which I heard is of a trumpet talking with me. And it says, the third thing, come up hither. Okay? So you have a door. He hears a voice like a trumpet, and then he goes up. Those are very important. Now, the study on the door, I did a whole study on that. I got kind of sidetracked here because I hit that, and I was like, I wonder what door means and things. Watch the study on the door. If you want to see an interesting study, Lord, Lord showed me some pretty interesting stuff there. But let's just show you here real quickly. John chapter 10. If you haven't seen that and you're like well i don't know if i have time well let's look at john chapter 10 on this thing of the door interesting because the book of revelation is revealed to john so here you have the book of john john chapter 10 verse 1 verily verily i say unto you he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold but climbeth up some other way the same as a thief and a robber but he that entereth in by the door and is the shepherd of the sheep there's the door there to him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, there's your voice, and leadeth them out, come up hither. There you see it. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Notice there, by the way, in verse 5, A stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. You know one of the things that's very hard for you as a Christian, for me as a Christian? That is to trust the, the prompting of the Lord. There are many times that you'll listen to some preacher or some guy on, on YouTube or whatever else. You'll hear somebody and you go, well, that sounds pretty good. I, I think what he's saying is right, but... You just get that feeling, that feeling like, I don't know what it is, just something makes me uncomfortable. And you kind of excuse it away. You go, well, I don't know, maybe, you know, it's just I'm, I'm imagining things or whatever else. Many times you'll find out later on that that guy was a crook the whole time. Ken Hoven is a perfect example. I fell for that guy. I thought he was a great Bible teacher and whatever else, defender of the faith and everything else. A defender of the Catholic faith, I guess. You know, Mr. Ecumenical. Incredible. But uh, I know other people. My wife, you know, is a good example. And she was like, first time I heard Ken Hoven, it was like, you know, why? Voice of a stranger. Not the Lord speaking through him, in other words. you got to learn to trust the Lord. And that's tough. It's very, di very difficult sometimes. But um, they didn't understand him. So let's look at verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. So who's the door in Revelation 4? Verse 1. 
Jesus. Verse 8 here in John 10. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in, up to heaven, come up hither, and out. Come back down at the second coming, the battle of Armageddon, Revelation 19, and he will and find pasture, it says there in the text, and find pasture, the millennial kingdom, the agrarian world that will be there at that point in time, farming and things like that, find pasture. Okay, so there you have the door. What about this thing of the voice like a trumpet? Again, I've covered this in other studies, but I'll cover it here again because I know that some people just start watching. And I know it's kind of difficult to get through uh, over a thousand sermons that I've put up. Take you a while. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Turn there in your King James Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 15. Verse 51 and 52. Remember, it was a voice that sounded like a trumpet. Okay, it says here, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Hmm. You know, it really irritates me that this Donald Trump guy got elected. You know, I you know, pretty much predicted it. I said, yeah, it's... I think it's going to be Trump because of, you know, the the whole Catholic Al Smith thing and stuff like this. And, you know, I figured, yeah, he'd be the one would be the best chewing for the whole thing. And now you get Christians like claiming the guy's some kind of chosen special guy from the Lord or something to restore America. To, it's disgusting, it's sickening. But the point is, the word Trump in the King James Bible is only used two times. Let's look at the second time. First Thessalonians chapter four. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Notice that. That's very important. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Who is the Lord himself? Jesus. So when you look up, you see the door open. Jesus is the door. He calls his sheep by name. Come up hither. Up we go. You see? The voice that sounds like a trumpet. It all lines up perfectly. You say, well, you know, it's in Matthew chapter 24. Keep your hand there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I can go over to Matthew chapter 24. The biggest problem for posties, posty toasties, is they don't compare scripture. They just try to blend everything all together and say it's all teaching the same thing. You say, yeah, but don't talk to me about it. It's all teaching the same thing. I won't listen to you. Yeah, because they're heretics. Matthew chapter 24, verse 31 and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Okay? You say, well, see there, trumpet, and it's trumpet over at the 1 Thessalonians 4. Okay, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. The trump of God. Matthew 24, verse 31. His angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Trumpet and trump are two different things. Trump is the sound, it's the voice, if you want to be technical, the actual definition is the voice of the trumpet. It's the sound the trumpet makes. Where's that at in Matthew chapter 24? It's not in there. It's an angel blowing the trumpet in Matthew 24. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it's God, His voice, the trump of God. Revelation chapter 4. Go back there. Revelation chapter 4, our text where we're at here in our study. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. 
It's so clear. And you get these posties. And, oh, there's not any clear scriptures. In the, they're lying. Absolutely, totally lying. If you're saved, the Lord will eventually get you to believing that the body of Christ is leaving before the time of Jacob's trouble. If you're lost, well, then you're absolutely right. You will be going into the tribulation time period. But, what about this thing of come up hither? Okay, well, we saw it there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. We saw the thing about the dead in Christ go up, and then we which are alive and remain go up. And that happens in the gospel accounts, right? No, it does not. Turn to Luke 17. You say, well, it says about, you know, that there he shall send his angels from the four winds of heaven to gather together his elect. You know, they're, they're being gathered together. Don't you understand? They're being called up. It doesn't say up. They're being gathered together. And Luke chapter 17 debunks this myth that, uh, that there, somehow in Matthew chapter 24, there's a rapture. There is no rapture in Matthew chapter 24, or Mark 13, or Luke 17, or Luke 21. There's no rapture. I believe that there is a catching up someplace within the time of Jacob's trouble. You read about that back in the book of Revelation. I forget which chapter it is. We'll be getting to it in a little bit. But I do believe that there is a gathering there, and they're called up. But it's not at the end of it. And it certainly is not Christians. Again, I've proved that in other studies. Luke chapter 17, verse 34. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, and the other left. And people say, see, that's the rapture. You know, one's a Christian, one's not. And they get they taken up, and they, and they go, oh, where'd my co-worker go? Or whatever else. Not the case. Keep reading. Verse 37. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? Where are they being taken? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Revelation chapter 19, the battle of Armageddon. 200 million man army that's coming out to destroy the Jews that have been taken out of Jerusalem, that have left Jerusalem, and they're running away from the Antichrist, and they're hiding out there in the wilderness, and the Antichrist says, Okay, all we got to do is take out these Jews. Do you realize if the Antichrist could destroy all of the Jews, it would prove that God's a liar? Because God confirmed His covenant with Abraham forever to His seed, physical seed. So Satan, all he has to do is take care of the Jews. And if he can wipe out every single last Jew on the earth, he can say, hey, God, you can't be God. You said that you were going to preserve those people. They're all gone now. You're a liar. Book of Titus says God cannot lie. See? That's why Satan is behind this anti-Semitic stuff. I'm not saying I support everything that Israel does. I'm not saying I support the nation of Israel and every decision that they make. There's some very wicked decisions being made from that country. But I'll tell you what, that's their land over there. And they have a right to it. And when you get professing Christians coming out and blaming everything on the Jews and saying the Jews should be wiped out, you're not dealing with a real Christian. You're dealing with a fraud. Absolutely, completely. Don't like it? Shut the video off and go watch some Nazi propaganda. For, or Catholic propaganda. It's pretty much the same thing. If you're into replacement theology. Go back to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation 4. Revelation chapter 4, verse 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Okay. Um, notice he goes up immediately. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, what does it say there? It says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Immediately I was in the Spirit. Like that. Now, I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again. There's a big difference between the second coming of Jesus Christ that you read about in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, and 21, and the rapture of 1 Corinthians 15, 
51 through 58, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18, and also John chapter 10, verses 1 through 9, is also a rapture uh, passage. It's not talking about the second coming. And part of the big difference is when you see the sun and the moon, you know, the sun being dark and the moon turning into blood, the stars falling from heaven, then you can look up because your redemption is drawing nigh. That's the second coming. But he comes down and you're going out. They're being taken out of Jerusalem. They're running away from the Antichrist army, which is pursuing after them, trying to kill those few Jews that remain. All right? That's the second coming. The rapture is a, mo a moment in the twinkling of an eye immediately. Boom, just like that. So you see, understanding that the church is going to be leaving before this time period even begins, the Great Tribulation, properly called the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm always going to say that. Understanding that, you need to understand you will not have time to stop doing what you're doing. Whatever you're doing, when the Lord says, okay, says your name and says, come up hither. Calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So he's going to say your name. He's going to say, hey, come up hither. Hey, Brian, come up hither. I'm not going to say, oh, just, okay, i got to go to the bathroom real quick. I'll be ready in five minutes. All right. Oh, nuts. I wanted to get rid of that book. Yeah, uh, yeah I'll get rid of that thing. And, oh, I didn't want him seeing me on that website or whatever else. There's no time. It's a purifying hope. Again, I've talked about that in other studies. That's the beauty of the rapture. Understanding it's going to be, bam, you're gone. It's a challenge, brethren. I mean, none of us are perfect. I know that. I'm not saying you need to be sinlessly perfect. No, but you need to purify your life. You need to think before you watch something bad or before you're doing something bad or whatever else. You need to think, what if the Lord comes back and I'm doing this? Purifying hope, brethren. But look at verse 3. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight, sight like unto an emerald. Okay, be prepared to get offended to a certain group of the brethren out there. Uh, I've gotten kicked for this one too. I'm a heretic for saying what I'm about to say. And that is, uh, I find it interesting that... Um, you get Doc Marquis, which I have serious questions about that guy. He's very serious misgivings about that man. Uh, I think he's a covert Satanist, but um, whatever. But he comes out and he says that the collars of the god and goddess of witchcraft are red and green. Okay, well, uh, where do you think they got it from? Satan counterfeits what God does. And it's interesting. I'm going to put up a picture here on screen of different stones in the Bible Jasper, you have is red. Sardin or sardius, another way to say it, is also red. And what is emerald? Green. So when we get up there and we actually see God sitting on his throne, it's going to be red and green, like Christmas time. Oh, he said the evil word. Christmas. Oh, okay. Weinachten. How about that one? That doesn't mean Christmas in German. It's like Night of the Holy Child, essentially. Because, you know, anti-Christmas Christians make a big deal about Christ Mass. See, it's a, it's a Christmas means Christ Mass. It literally means the death of Christ. So you say, Merry Christmas, you're saying, Merry Death of Christ, meaning the Mass. Stuff like this. They constructed that whole thing. It doesn't mean that. Again, I've done studies on that. You know, there are some things that we can agree to disagree on as brethren, and celebration of holidays is one of them, all right? I don't recommend Santa Claus. I don't re recommend going into all kinds of credit card debt or something like that. shouldn't even have credit cards, but side issue. I don't recommend that, okay? But if you're taking your child and you're showing them the pretty lights at Christmas time and you're saying, here's a gift for, for you from the Lord gave me the money to be able to buy this. Don't bring Santa Claus into the thing. Santa Claus is satanic, um, but... You don't, whatever, not a big deal. Make some Christmas cookies or something like that and whatever, put on joy to the world or hark the herald angels sing. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? Give me a break. Some of these people. <laughs> but just had to add that in there, you know, 
because to me, when I get into the time of the holiday season there in December, the month of December, it's always been one of my favorite times of the year. It's a wonderful time to witness to people. People are more open to hearing about Jesus Christ. I mean, we've had many opportunities to witness to people at this time of the year that's coming very soon. Uh, we're in November, mid-November right now, so it's going to be December, uh, Christmas time soon. But there's just something about the collars red and green that's always gotten to me, and I, and I never quite understood that until I started to study. What are these stones all about? They're red and green. Interesting. So God's throne is literally the collars of what we would celebrate as Christmas. I thought that was pretty interesting. And again, please don't lie about me. Please, I mean, I, I get so sick and tired of that sometimes. I mean, some of you that just stab me in the back, one minute you're my friend and everything else, and then it's just like I say something that you don't approve of, and it just <clears throat> stab me in the back. If you don't agree, then okay, say, Brother Brian, I don't agree with him in that. Fine, thank you. That proves you have a mind and you're independent thinking and stuff. Praise the Lord for that. Whatever. Okay? <laughs> but don't stab me in the back because I like Christmas time. And don't say, well, he's saying that, you know, the red and green there justifies every practice of Christmas. I didn't say that either. All right? But let's continue. Verse 4. If you're still with me. <laughs> Revelation 4, verse 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. All right. Why are there men in heaven that are crowned with white robes on before the time of Jacob's trouble even begins? Hmm. What was that thing, that event that happens? It's uh, the, Oh, yes, that's right. The judgment seat of Christ when you get crowns of reward. But I thought that was for Christians. Well, then why would there be Christians in heaven before the Antichrist even shows up on the earth? Before Revelation chapter 6, 1 even occurs? That would probably mean that it's a, a pre-trib rapture, wouldn't it? You'd think I'd get through to some of these posty toasties after a while some things kind of go over their head but look over at revelation chapter 5 we'll see the identity here of these 24 elders revelation chapter 5 verses 8 through 10 let's read that and when he had taken the book the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors which are the prayers of saints and they sung a new song saying thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof now look at this. Here's the identity of them. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Okay. Are they saved Christians? Yes. We are the ones that are redeemed to God by his blood. And we are the ones that are promised eternal, or uh, excuse me, millennial inheritance, ruling and reigning with Christ. Okay? I believe it's over in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And so, uh, you know, it says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And there's other verses, too, that talk about that. But there's a lot of debate back and forth. Who are these 24 elders and things? And, you know, I really kind of was like, I really don't know. But the Lord helped me in the one study on the interracial marriage thing, um, which, again, gets me in trouble with people that are into, into uh, integration, which I'm going to talk about here in just a minute. But I believe firmly now that these 24 elders are two people from each of the 12 national boundaries. I mean, look at the text. It says, Hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. They identify who they are. There are two from each of those 12 boundaries. I'm going to show you the scripture on this here in as, just a minute here as we continue. Let's look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32. I'll show you where I'm getting the support for this. Deuteronomy 32, back to your Old Testament again. Let me 
before you start screaming heresy and whatever else, just please open your mind a little bit and consider what I'm saying here. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7. Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee, and thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people, look at this, according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. How many tribes are there in Israel? Twelve. Then there are twelve nat natural boundaries that separate the nations. What is twelve times two? If you took two from each of the twelve boundaries there, you would have 24. And a lot of people will try to say falsely that the 24 elders are the 12 apostles and the 12, you know, heads of the different families there in Israel. Can't be, because they're out of every kindred uh, um, tongue, people, nation. They're out of all the 12 boundaries. So they can't be all Jews. Not to mention the fact that they weren't really redeemed by the blood of the Lamb back in the Old Testament. Okay, The blood eventually did pay for their sins and they were taken out of Abraham's bosom and up to heaven. Again, you know, all this stuff I've talked about in other studies. So if you're going, what is he talking about? Watch the other videos. Again, understanding of Scripture is going to take you time. It's going to take a lot of study. You can't you know, just come to the Lord and, and expect fast food religion. You don't want that. But I believe firmly that these 24 elders are two people from each of the 12 nations, national boundaries. I'll say it that way. Okay? Again, I've talked about that in other studies. Not going to get into it here. But you say, well, that's, but you showed, act, you know, Deuteronomy chapter 32. You know, I'll get this thing and they'll say, you know, you're showing Old Testament. You need to show New Testament. Okay, well, let's go to Acts chapter 17. Are the boundaries still in place? Acts chapter 17, verse 26. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And they'll go, period. No, no, that's a comma. A lot of people don't want to read the last part of the verse. And hath determined before, or hath, hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. The boundaries are still in effect. God never said, hey, the 12 you know, natural national boundaries back there that I set up in Deuteronomy 32, don't worry about that anymore. He did it with the animal sacrifice. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, brought in the perfect sacrifice. His blood was shed on the cross. You don't need to sacrifice animals anymore to atone for sin. You don't need to do that. But the nat national boundaries that God set up back in Deuteronomy 32 are still binding on us today. Right there in Acts chapter 17. So don't tell me, oh, Old Testament, Old Testament and stuff. And you know, another thing I'm going to get, I'm sure it's going to be in the comments, you're a racist, you're a racist. Let me tell you about that. Part of the Jesuit agenda, and I want to show you the proof, by the way, it is the Jesuits, again, that are behind this whole thing. Part of the Jesuit agenda is to create and incite a race war. And we are very close to that here in America, especially. Racism is a very wicked thing. Okay, Racist, a racist person, racism means one race feeling superior to the other and saying we're going to eliminate you because you are not part of our race. That is evil. That is bad. But for Christians... Bible-believing Christians to say, hey, you know what? I am of a different ethnicity, a different nation, kindred, people, tongue, than you are. I am different than you, and I don't want to join with you. If you're a Christian, praise the Lord, we'll be together in heaven. But you are with your people, and I am with my people. That's not racism. Now, if I would say I'm a Christian, and I hate black people, and would like to see all black people dead, that's racism. But if I say I'm a Christian, a white Christian, and I have a black Christian sister or black Christian brother down there, and I want you to stay down there and I'm going to stay up here, that's not against Scripture. Right? 
And people, again, you know, I get this thing and they'll say, well, you should go back to Germany because you're from Germany and things like that. My ancestors are from Germany. You're out of bounds being in America. Yeah, but you see, there was another prophecy given back there with Noah and his three sons. And that is that Japheth, my ancestor is a white man, Japheth is going to dwell in the tents of Shem. America, North America, is a Shemitic country. And my ancestors fled from the Roman Catholic persecution over in Germany to come here to America. All right? And they did, by the way. They were Anabaptist. All right? I'm not making that up. But let me show you something here. I thought I had this in my notes. I'll just have to go to it here quickly. Um, let me show you the thing of why God does not want uh, integration, all the races getting together. I'll show you. I mean, Acts chapter 17, go back to Genesis chapter 11. Um, Acts chapter 17 talks about that they might feel after the Lord and uh, they might search out for the Lord when you have people in their actual boundaries. Genesis chapter 11, verse 6. And the Lord said that you have here the Tower of Babel, the whole thing. They're coming together. You know, verse 1 in chapter 11 says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Jump down to verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Now let me just stop right there for you Christians out there that say integration is okay and wonderful and a good Christian thing. We should all come together and drop our differences. Um, do you line up with that verse? Is God for that or against that? The people are one. We should all be one. We should put aside our differences. You're right back in the Tower, tower of Babel. So don't you dare come down on me. Don't you dare call me a racist. All right, number one, I'm not a racist. Number two, I line up with the Bible. My beliefs line up with the Bible. Yours do not. Verse 7, this is what the Lord thinks about this whole thing of racial integration, everybody coming together, all the nations getting together. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, and they, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, or Babel, however you want to say that, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Notice too it says there that the languages were changed. Back in Revelation chapter 4, it talks about tongues. Their tongues are different. Tongue and language are synonymous in the Bible. They're the same thing. Hmm. So, God doesn't want all the people getting together. You say, well, brother, you know, okay, I can see that. I can see that we should be separate as nations, but I can certainly marry somebody of a different nationality, ethnicity. How does that make sense? I don't understand that. I mean, if God says, hey, I want all the people separate, living separate from each other, and that doesn't mean you can't trade with each other and stuff like that. It just means, hey, you stay down there with your people. We'll stay here with our people. We can trade, be friendly to another, each other and stuff. And I love people of other kindreds and things. I don't hate them. You know, absolutely not. I don't hate people like that. Just because I look at the way your the skin color or whatever else, your ethnicity, and say, I hate you. That's not me. It's not my wife. It's not either of us. But how is it? I, I just have a hard time understanding these people that tell me, yes, I understand integration is wrong, nations coming together and breaking the boundaries down. I understand that that's wrong, but I'm totally okay with marrying somebody from another kindred. How does that work? It's kind of weird, isn't it? But I just need to do a little side little issue here. Because this thing is getting big. I mean, there's riots all over America right now. This whole thing of, we will not accept Donald Trump as a president. And this Black Lives Matter, which, you know, White Lives Matter is a racist organization. But Black Lives Matter is freedom fighters. Um, they are stoking the flames of this whole thing. Again, understand how the devil does things. The devil and his favorite group of people, the Jesuit order. 
And again, you know, I'm not making this up. There's people go, you think Jesuits are behind everything? Well, when I see a guy and it says SJ or he's trained by the Jesuits, what am I supposed to say? Maybe it's the cookie monster. Maybe he's not really a Jesuit. Maybe he's Big Bird or, or Mickey Mouse or something like that. He's called a Jesuit. The facts are facts, people. I know the Bible says in the end times people turn away their ears from the truth, but come on, give me a break here, okay? Uh, you don't have to like what I say, but you know, don't attack me because I'm telling the truth, all right? But the anti-miscegenation laws here in America that were forbidding people of other races to, to intermarry, black and white and things like that, they were not allowed to intermarry, the two lawyers, Cohen and I can't think of the other guy's name, but the two lawyers were both Jesuit educated, graduates of Jesuit universities. I showed that in another study. I mean, it's insane. But there's a Jesuit on YouTube that's stirring up this whole thing. See, again, what do the Jesuits do? The Hegelian dialectic, if you don't know about this. Thesis, antithesis, or antithesis, and then synthesis. They will raise up two opposing things, and then they offer the solution. Do we have to have a solution? See? That's what they do. So what they do is they create racial tension and problems by bringing people in. They used to call, I think it was called block busting years ago. And they would take black people, put them in buses, and they'd ship them in to white neighborhoods. And they'd say, okay, move into that house. And they'd put black people into the houses in white neighborhoods. Well, it doesn't take a brainiac to figure out pretty soon there's problems. There's tensions. See, that's what they do. And then they can come along and they can offer the solution. So right now, the Jesuits are very, very busy stoking the flames, putting the fire to this racial tension stuff. And they're getting the black people angry at the white people, and the white people are getting angry at the black people. And, you know, I, I heard about some of this black-on-white violence that the news media does not talk about, and it is real. I've, I've seen that in the past. I've never been attacked by a black person, but I was literally in a situation where my you know, best friend at the time, him and I were walking along and, and he was attacked by a black guy and he took care of the situation. Uh, didn't kill him or anything, so don't think that, but, you know, beat the guy up, basically. Way back before I got saved. Um, I knew of a young white guy that was jumped by a bunch of blacks in the city down near, you know, where I'm from in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and they jumped him, beat him up. Didn't even want his money, they just wanted to beat him up. And this was before the whole knockout game thing and all that other stuff. But there is black on white violence. And somehow that goes unreported for the most part. But a white guy, a white police officer kills a black guy and it's national, international news. Uh, what are they doing? They're stoking this whole thing. I'm going to tell you why here in a minute. But uh, this guy's name is Colin Flaherty. All right. And I was watching some of this guy's videos and I'm just like, a couple. I saw a couple of his videos and I thought, all it's doing is just making me hate black people, which I don't want to do. I don't hate black people. And I'm just like, I don't know what it is about this guy. And I thought, and the thought popped into my head. I thought, he almost looks like he's some kind of a Catholic or something, like a maybe even Jesuit trained. That's what came into my mind. And I'm going to show you a little Camtasia video here going from his LinkedIn profile and showing where he was educated. Oh, yeah, he's a Jesuit. Here's the proof. All right, here we are at Colin Flaherty's YouTube channel page. And you can see here's his book, Don't Make the Black Kids Angry. And he goes down through here. You can see it's featured on all this stuff right here. And uh, here he has uploads. And you can see all this reporting these things of black on white crime and whatever else and things. And... Uh, I'll show you a little bit about the guy. Here's his LinkedIn profile. You can see here, published by Colin. There's his book again. There's another thing about a white girl bleed a lot or something like this, I think. But uh, contributing writer, San Diego Magazine, columnist, reporter, reporter, writer, researcher, council representative, staff assistant. You can look at all this stuff later. I'm just kind of skimming it here quickly. Education. University of San Francisco. What is that? University of San Francisco. Here you have their website. 
right here. You go down. Who we are. The University of San Francisco, a premier Jesuit university. Jesuit. You see it right there. Our history. There again. Go up. Show that. The University of San Francisco, the city's first university, was established by the Jesuits in October of 1855. All right, so Colin Flaherty here is a went to a Jesuit school. And you have the University of California, San Diego, which we have this thing here, St. Francis de Sales, this whole thing. Um, again, you can see. Roman Catholic. This over here, Sales Eanum School, Roman Catholic Independent School for Boys. So University of Delaware, Sales Eanum School, right there. So again, this guy is went to a Jesuit school, and definitely a Roman Catholic. Uh, and again, people will say, well, yes, but he's not a Jesuit because he's not technically a Jesuit priest. Well, if you've seen the Kent Hovind study, we showed you two Jesuit priests that said that any alumni uh, or presently attending student or even a retreatant um, is considered a Jesuit. So, yes, he is a Jesuit. He is Jesuit educated. And they educate uh, their people, these Jesuits educate their people to carry out the um, different agendas of the Roman Catholic Church. And race war is definitely one of the agendas of the Roman Catholic Church. First, they, they promote integration. Uh, the, the Jesuit lawyers were the ones that overthrew the anti-miscegenation, or the uh, miscegenation laws, anti-miscegenation laws, excuse me. It was two Jesuit lawyers that overthrew it. So then you could have race mixing, and they create the race mixing in uh, knowing that it would eventually lead to a race war which is exactly what he's doing. He's fanning the flames of this thing on his YouTube channel and showing all the black on white crime and everything else. And uh, his book is also is, by the way, is uh, recommended by Alex Jones. Um, so I could say a lot more about this guy, but that gives you the basis of this whole thing. As Jesuit trained man, and there's a lot of others too, by the way, Roman Catholic um, people uh, that are actually promoting you know, getting the fire stoked up for a race war. There you go. And again, you know, people are going to say, it doesn't make him a Jesuit. Well, we showed that in the Ken Hovind study that uh, two Jesuit uh, provincials, I think, the one that was a provincial, and uh, which is a very high-level Jesuit, and he was saying that anybody that goes through a Jesuit school, alum, alumni currently attending, even retreatants, those that go to Jesuit retreats, they're considered as being part of the larger society of Jesus, the company of Jesus. Jesuits. So don't tell me he's not a Jesuit. You go off to a Jesuit school, you're going to be trained these things. How to bring people back to Roman Catholicism. I mean, that's the whole point. Again, I've had people, you know, oh, you're crazy, you're crazy, calling everybody a Jesuit. <laughs> if it's there, you know, what am I supposed to do with it? Right? Right? And, you know, and I asked this one woman, I said, uh, did the Counter-Reformation end? No reply. Of course, she made fun of me and stuff like this. They all do that, you know. When they can't handle facts, they'll make fun of you. But uh, let me just show you another little symbol here. I found this online, a um, Catholic, uh, I forget if it was a school, I think it was a school down in uh, Louisiana. Louisiana was one of the first. I don't even know if they ever had anti-miscegenation laws, um, but very, very strong French Catholics down there in Louisiana. Um, but check this symbol out. I'll put it up here on the screen. Uh, look at that. Celebrating 50 years of integration. A Jesuit school. But I'm a Bible-believing Christian, but I believe in integration. Sorry, I don't buy that. Integration is not an option. If you're a Christian, you have to stand against it. But let's continue. Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. And by the way, I, let me... Okay, I, gotta, I just remembered. I looked down at my notes here. Just saw this. Okay. There are three reasons why a race war is wanted by the Jesuit order. Number one, a race war is completely indiscriminate. 
you can't say, wait a second, I'm a pacifist. Or, hey, I don't believe in war. Hey, I actually have some good friends that are black people. I'm a Christian. I don't want to fight. It doesn't matter. If you're white, you're on that side. If you're black, you're on that side. If you're Hispanic, you're on this side. If you're on, see, it's completely indiscriminate. And I know right now they'll say, well, there's people that are white that are part of Black Lives Matter. Uh, yeah, but wait till things break down and a race war actually happens. See? So if you want to foment wars in a country to overthrow the population to get lots of people killed, a race war is your best bet. The very best bet. Because people will naturally line up, they'll instinctively, instinctively line up with their own kindreds. Why? God created you that way. Number two, as I said, everybody is forced to fight. You don't have an option in a race war. When there's a race war, you can't sit by the sidelines. You're forced to fight in it. And number three, God will not defend integration. So if you want to do something as a Satanist, you find out the things that God hates and whatever else and the things that God says, hey, I'm against that, and then you get the people to do those things that God hates, God's not going to protect them. You want to destroy a city, the best thing that you can do is start gay pride parades, pride fests and stuff like that. Pride goeth before destruction and in Holy Spirit before a fall. You get the people to be prideful of their sin and then say, stand back and just let God judge the thing. See? And integration, God is not going to protect a bunch, a bunch of integrationists. And by the way, you say, well, what are we supposed to do, brother? You know, I mean, I, I, you're kind of being doom and gloom here or something. You sound like a prepper. I'm not prepping. Okay, I'm not telling you we're going to go and we have to endure to the end to be saved and all this. We're going into the tribulation and I'm not doing that at all. What I'm saying is I'm warning about some dangerous times that could be happening before the rapture. I've never said that we're going to sit on satin pillows down here until the Lord catches us away. Uh, there, there's been some real bad times in church history where Christians have had to suffer. So what is my advice for a Bible-believing Christian uh, if a race war starts? And they're saying, you know, the inauguration and things, you know, people of collar, you know, somehow I guess I don't have collar. That's kind of weird. But, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, people of collar, you know, have to rise up and stop this white usurper, Donald Trump and stuff. It's kind of funny because Hillary's white. But, you know, they don't seem to notice that, I guess. Um, but, you know, because the media controls their brains. But, uh, you know, we have to rise up and we have to stop this guy and everything else. And, and we have to stop him and his, you know, evil white cops and things like this. It could happen in the next couple of months. I don't know. I'm praying that it doesn't happen. But uh, what's the way that you stop a race war? You say, by getting all together. Let's all just get together and just show love to each other. That's not going to stop it. That's not going to stop it at all. You know the way you stop a race war? Segregation. Get away. You know, the police get called. There's a, a fight, domestic disturbance or something like this. What do they do when they get there? Do they come over and there's the two guys fighting and beating each other up and stuff and they're on the ground just on each other and then the other guy throws him other and, and they're, they're fighting and the police officer goes please stop it oh stop stop you know show love to each other you should be getting along we're all brothers here no the police officers grab the guys pull them apart and say okay get, break it up break it up you get over there and the, that police officer takes that guy over to that cruiser and this police officer takes him over to that cruiser the other guy you know and they question him and stuff like that they separate them The only way to stop a race war in America is to segregate, to get away. You know, don't listen to the propaganda too that gets people in, you know, riled up and stuff like that. But uh, people need to segregate. And you say, but God could stop it. You don't put faith in God. God's not going to st stop something that will protect integration. He'd be contradicting his word. He told people, you stay separate. People say, no, we're going to come together and we want you to protect us. It isn't going to happen. It isn't going to happen. You say, well, Brother Brian, I'm married to somebody of a different kindred. I'm married to somebody of a different race or whatever you want to, whatever term you want to use. you got a problem on your hands. If a race war starts, you're going to have an issue. So what am I supposed to do? <laughs> That's between you and God. 
Not my problem. Sorry. Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. You'll see that all through the book of Revelation, the seven spirits of God, over and over and over and over and over again. Interesting. But what does it say there? Lightnings and thunderings and voices out of the throne. Keep your hand there in Revelation chapter 4 and go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 28. Okay, Jesus speaking here. It says, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Hmm. So to the saved... We hear God's voice, it sounds like a trumpet talking. It's musical, it's melodious. It's comforting, it's reassuring. But what are the lost here? Thunder? Hmm. So, thunder means bad things. Trumpets, I know you could make a you know bad thing with a trumpet, you know, playing taps or something on a trumpet means somebody's dead. <laughs> but, you know, trumpets can be a good thing. Musical. Hmm. Pretty interesting. Which I've taught this again for many years, and that is when the rapture happens, I believe we're going to hear a beautiful, melodious voice that sounds like a trumpet, and we're going to be like, ah, oh, wow, you know. And I've known people that have had rapture dreams. I've had a few myself, haven't in a very long time, but you're dreaming and you're doing some kind of thing, and all of a sudden you hear, you feel kind of weird, and you look up at the sky and you see a bright light, and you, and you go, oh, like that, and it's like excitement, and, you, and then you wake up. And you're just like, whoa, what was that? You know, I've had that happen a couple times. But that's basically what it's going to be. Except you're going to hear your voice, or you're, you're going to hear a voice that sounds like a trumpet saying your name, that's what I meant to say, and you're going to go up. It's going to be a great time. But let's continue here. Verse 6, Revelation chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. We'll read that. And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf. And the, the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Hmm. Very interesting. A couple things we need to look at here quickly. Keep your hand there in Revelation chapter 4. And we're going to go back to Isaiah chapter 6. Back into the Old Testament. I'm going to show you what these creatures are. Isaiah chapter 6. And verse... Two. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. So these creatures, if you look back there in Revelation chapter 4, the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 2, above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. Cherubim have four wings. Okay, if you want to here a detailed study on the thing of angels. What are they? Look that up. I have a whole study on the thing of angels I did many years ago. Um, but seraphim are what is spoken of here in the book of Revelation, chapter 4. So we're going to see them. Uh, they going to be quite interesting creatures, definitely. But I want you to notice something very interesting. Notice the last part of verse 8. There's a thing that goes around, people say, you know, the oneness or something like this, oneness Pentecostals or whatever, and they say Jesus is, there is no Trinity, there's no Godhead, it's just Jesus is everything. Uh, they don't understand the mystery of godliness. 
our, the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, I think it is, about the mystery of godliness is great. Um, there's a lot about the Lord that you just, we're not going to be able to understand it till we actually see Him in person. But God is three in one. He's three distinct um, persons in one. Right? That's revealed uh, mainly in the New Testament. And it's a theme that you see over and over and over again. And check this out. This is very interesting here. Notice the threes. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. Okay? Lord God Almighty. There's a second three. Which was, and is, and is to come. How many th sets of three was that? Three. Interesting, isn't it? It's quite a book we have here. Verses 9 through 10. So don't let anybody come along and say to you, you know, uh, well, the, the Trinity is a foreign doctrine to Scripture. You know, the word Trinity is not in there. Well, the word Trinity is not in the King James Bible, but Godhead is. And you see the three in one over and over and over again. And the clearest one is 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, which the new versions have removed because they say there's no manuscript evidence. And then you show them that, there, yes, there is actually manuscript evidence. And they say, well, it's only very late manuscript evidence, you know, new copies. It wasn't there early on in the early church history and things. But then you show them the fact that there were church fathers that were actually referring to 1 John 5, 7, quoting 1 John 5, 7. So uh, don't fall for the thing of they call it the Johannine comma, big terms and stuff meaning that uh, it was added later on to 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. It was not. It's part of the original text. I guarantee it, because it's a theme that goes throughout the Bible. But let's continue. Verses 9 through 10. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne saying, we'll get to that in a minute, but that's the attitude that you should have as a Christian. Understanding when you come to God and you are in that broken, contrite, repentant state where you're just like, I have nothing, I have nothing that I can offer you, Lord. Please save me. And He saves you and He makes you a bondservant. Okay? You're not some kind of a, a big shot that can walk around and say, I'm just like holier than everybody else out here and I'm I'm just like this, oh man, I'm somebody. You're still supposed to remain lowly and humble. Even to the point of when you get through the judgment seat of Christ and God gives you a crown. I mean, the God of the universe. Think of it. The God of the universe and He takes a crown of gold that He made and He places it upon your head and says, come and rule and reign with me. And you take that crown and you walk around and you say, my crown's bigger than your crown. Mm, yeah. Uh-uh. The 24 elders, you know, that God chose them, two from each of the 12 national boundaries. And he places a crown on their heads. I don't even know who's going to be the ones that qualify for that, you know, two from each of the boundaries. I mean, they're going to have to be some pretty strong Christians or something that did some real great things from the, for the Lord and yet even them as good a Christians as these people are going to be take those crowns off and throw them before the throne do you do that as a Christian hey uh, boy I just got this new job and whatever else well it's because I work hard I put in a lot of time there you know I'm, I'm a good worker or do you take the crown off and you say, all glory belongs to the Lord. He's the one that got me that new position or the, uh, the promotion or whatever there at work. It's not me. It's not on me. It's all of the Lord. Hey, I, I really appreciate that sermon you did, brother. All glory goes to the Lord. Hey, uh, sister, I really... Uh, like the recipe that you put out. I don't even know. Whatever, whatever the thing is, take the crown off of your head and throw it before the throne. All glory goes to the Lord. 
you have a child, you're out there in the grocery store and they come up and they say, your child is so well behaved. You don't say, thank you. Well, I've put them through extensive studies and research and things and I've studied child psychiatry. And glory, you know, to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Throw it up there. Get in the practice now. So that when you get to heaven, you're ready to worship the Lord. Verse 11, Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. God created everything for his pleasure. You go out in nature sometime, nice beautiful day, and just sit down, just watch those birds flying from tree to tree. It's amazing how birds can fly right through the branches of trees and never hit one. And, you know, I mean, if I tried to do that, if the Lord gave me wings for a day or something, I wouldn't make it probably a half hour. I'd be hitting stuff like crazy. <laughs> I don't have the coordination. These birds just flying, you know, and there's a butterfly flying, and there's a nice lake over there, and the duck's quacking on it and stuff like this. There's a fish swimming in the water. And, you know, can bring you pleasure to look at what God created, the handiwork of God's creation. That's the point. He created all things for His pleasure, including you. How do you bring God pleasure with your life? I'll show you a good verse on that. Go to 3 John. Just back a few books, two books actually. The third epistle of John. I'll show you the best way to bring the Lord pleasure. Verse 1. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. A statement divinely inspired, spoken through the mouth of John about how God feels. You know what brings God joy? You know what brings Him pleasure? When you walk in the truth. You say, well, praise the Lord, brother. I, I believe a lot of truth. I didn't say believe. Walk. It's a big difference there. You say, I don't understand. Let me explain. You can understand and have the knowledge in your head of a lot of truth. But when you walk in it is when you go out there into the world and you say, okay, the things that the Lord showed me through His Word, through the preaching of His Word, I'm going to apply them in my life. When as a woman you go out and you say, you know what? God convicted me. I know the Bible says that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. I believe that's the truth. I believe women should dress modestly. Are you going to walk in it? Well, yeah, brother, but I, I just, you know, I don't really have a whole lot of dresses or things like that or, you know, whatever stuff, you know, modest clothes. So I, maybe someday eventually, but right now I got, I, you know, I got to get to work. I got to do this. I got to... You can understand the truth, but not walk in the truth. You understand? Hey, I believe that this King James Bible is the Word of God. I really do believe that, you know, the arguments for the King James Bible, this is God's book. What about when you get around your uh, professing Christian relatives? You're going to stick your neck out? Well, the Bible says, Thou, uh, you are worthy, O Lord, because you don't want to say thou art. Because that may, might, uh, might make them make fun of you. Um, the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, okay, the new versions, they, they do say it of some evil or something. I don't want to fight over it. The Bible version issue is so divisive. I believe the King James Bible. That's the only Bible that I use. I just don't want to argue with people about it. You see? 
Now, what brings God joy is when you have some Christian that says, you know what, I see the truth, I understand the truth, and I'm going to walk by the truth. You know why? Because I know what the other options are. I have lived in the world. I have done things the world's way, and it's always brought me pain. And I don't want the pain for my life, and I don't want to be a, 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 be a shameful thing in God's sight. I want Him to be happy with me and well pleased with me. I want Him to get pleasure from watching me, just like you sit down in the park there and you watch the birds flying through the trees and you go, this is beautiful. The Lord wants to look down at this wicked, disgusting world and He wants to see a Christian walking around just as a shining light in this dark, dark world. Looks down and He sees a Christian lady and she's walking along whistling a hymn or humming a hymn to herself and she's modestly apparelled and she carries a King James Bible and she's living right and she's walking in the truth. The Lord looks down and He says, she brings me pleasure. He looks down at a man and He says, that man gets made fun of, he gets mocked because he stands for my book and he has joy and he says, it'll all be worth it. That Christian lady down there, she's married to that lost man and she just puts up with it and she just prays to me and she doesn't lose faith in me and she's just reading my word and she, she brings me pleasure. She knows the truth and she walks in it. And when she, people glorify her and they say, hey, you really, I, I just want to say you're a very nice person. She doesn't take the glory for herself. She takes that glory off and she throws it back before my throne and says, all glory goes to God for it. I am nothing. I'm a sinner. I can't take any pride in who I am and who I've become after my salvation. The changes that have happened in me have been a result of the Lord working through me. All glory goes to the Lord. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the amazing challenges from your word. It's so humbling, Lord, uh, just to see how holy you are and uh, the responsibilities that we have as Christians, Lord, to mirror your holiness and your righteousness down here on this earth and to separate ourselves, Lord, to sanctify ourselves from this wicked world, not to be part of it. And um, help us, Lord, to walk in the truth, not just to hear it, not just to understand it, but to walk in it, Lord. Help us to realize that uh, the days are numbered, and there's not much longer to go. Help us to run with patience the race that's set before us. And look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, I just pray that you give us each strength for the tra trials and the, and the daily struggles that we go through. And uh, I just pray, Lord, that you wouldn't make us wait much longer. So I'm anxious to be able to hear your voice for the first time and look up and see the door and, and be caught up and get out of this wicked world, and to be with you forever. Even so, come Lord Jesus. I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, that's going to be it. What a book. What a amazing inheritance we have with our King James Bible. I've said this before, and I'm going to repeat it, brethren. People died for this book. This comes from a long line of Bibles, translations that were made. The people were executed for this book. And the people that did the executing are now the ones that have come out with the new versions. The Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church. It wasn't the medieval church, and well, it was the Catholic Church, but they've changed since... They've changed. They have, the Catholic Church has changed since back when they were burning, burning Christians at the stake. The Catholic Church is now worse. They're much worse. They're much more bloody. They're much more evil. Okay? This is our inheritance, brethren. The book of books. The greatest book that's ever been written. Scientific fact, by the way. You say, why no atheists that reject it? Because it judges their sins. Don't ever give up on this book. I can tell you right now, from studying this Bible for years and years and years, uh, this is where your hope is going to be found at. Yeah, it's great to go out into nature and see God's handiwork and understand that there is a God and that this all this didn't happen by random chance. There's a there's creation here. Yeah, that's 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 nice. 
that's that's a wonderful thing very calming and whatever else but i'll tell you what nothing beats the book not one thing stick by the book be people of the book that's why i call myself a bible believing christian i'm not a uh, baptist i'm not a methodist i'm not a lutheran i'm not a catholic i'm a bible believing christian and if you're a bible believing christian it'll clear up all this other junk that's out there in the world you know that's why i always go back to the book back to the bible so that's going to be it for revelation chapter four we will be doing chapter five maybe another week or so we'll see uh, some really neat stuff in chapter five and then we get into the interesting things in chapter six and it goes into that time of jacob's trouble and uh like I said, it's it's going to be kind of a challenging thing here um, because I'm, my intent for teaching this study, expository, expository study of the book of Revelation, is to be able to relate um, instruction and in righteousness mostly for the body of Christ today. Most of the book of Revelation is not doctrinally pointed at us as Christians. Um, it's for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, right now they reject the New Testament, but they'll accept it in the book of Revelation when that time period comes in. The book of Revelation is going to be the playbook that lines up with Daniel and a bunch of the old other you know, Old Testament books there. But uh, um, it's a challenge. So please keep me in your prayers. Keep us in your prayers, my wife and my son as well. And um, just wanted to thank everybody out there for praying and uh, for the support that God's people send us. I always try to put little things in there about that. We really appreciate it. And um, I think that's it for now. So <laughs> thank you very much for watching and we will see you in the next study.